Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about arrhythmia management today as part of our comprehensive clinical medicine board review series. So cardiac life support is uh, based on CPR and uh, some interventions depending on what type of a uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmia you have. So we're going to talk about asystole and PEA. We're going to talk about V-fib and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. We're going to talk about uh, SVT, AFib, atrial flutter, and bradycardia. So asystole and PEA. We're going to lump these together because you treat them the same, not because they're necessarily the same thing. Asystole, as you can see in the diagram here, is just when you flatline. You don't have any electrical activity, and therefore you have no pulse, and you're getting no circulation. Uh, pulseless electrical activity, I didn't give us a, a diagram to look at here because it could look a lot of different ways. And uh, it's a uh, electrical activity that looks like it should be producing a pulse but doesn't. So in the case of these two arrhythmias, uh, the first thing to remember is that we're not going to shock these people. They don't respond to any type of defibrillation. So skip that, move on to CPR. CPR is going to be the most important part of resuscitation. We also have uh, epinephrine. You give this one milligram IV every three to five minutes. And we used to talk about giving atropine to both of these, but we don't give them to either of them now. Uh, so no atropine. And then remember, there's uh, there's some uh, various causes that may be treatable that we need to keep in mind. So the five H's and T's are the possible causes of asystole and PEA. And the H's include hypovolemia, hypoxia, uh, hydrogen ion, which just means uh, acidosis, hyper or hypokalemia, um, and hypothermia. So some of these are potentially treatable and uh, should be treated as we are uh, resuscitating. Uh, the five T's are tablets, as in drug overdose, uh, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, uh, thrombosis, as in a cardiac thrombosis, and thrombosis, as in a pulmonary embolus. So um, these, a couple of these might make it harder for us to, to uh, resuscitate like tamponade and tension pneumothorax. So uh, don't hesitate in these situations to do invasive procedures because if they are requiring resuscitation, then uh, you're not going to make the situation worse by uh, doing a pericardiocentesis, for example, or, um, or a um, chest decompression. So make sure that you are doing those things to uh, enable the resuscitation to work. Let's move on to V-fib or pulseless VTAC. Um, CPR again is most important here. We shock these people at 200 joules uh, with a biphasic or if you have a, an AED then you don't have to uh, mess with the joules or anything like that and that's probably what most of us are going to be running into. There's also monophasic machines um, that you would run at 360 joules. The difference with the biphasic and the monophasic is the biphasic um, passes a charge that, that comes back through and they're more effective at lower uh, at lower amplitudes and so these are what we're mainly using today. Uh, epinephrine is also an important part of this. I, so if you um, do CPR for two minutes uh, after you've shocked somebody um, then you can give epinephrine every uh, three to five minutes and you can give one milligram. Um, sometimes you can replace that the first or second dose with uh, vasopressin if that's what you have on hand. Antiarrhythmics are questionable in how effective they're going to be here and so that's something that uh, you may or may not be using w once you are uh, further along in your training but um, but it looks like it's there's not a lot of great evidence and the advanced airway is, is kind of the same way. It, it will most likely be important in some cases but uh, there's no studies that show that getting a uh, that intubating somebody is going to necessarily 
improve their chances of survival here. Supraventricular tachycardia. So technically, this is any rhythm that's originating above the ventricle. Um, but usually when we're talking about SVT, we're talking about uh, paroxysmal SVT or uh, PSVT. And uh, those are, um, I won't get into uh, how they work because I don't actually know how they work, but, um, but generally those involve a loop of electrical activity that is causing the tachycardia. So with these, uh, if the patient is unstable, Make sure this isn't sinus tac, uh, first of all. Um, if the patient is unstable, then you do synchronized electrical cardioversion. Um, and this, this may hurt people. Um, and so if the, if the patients are showing signs of pain, then you may want to give analgesia or sedation uh, as, as appropriate. I don't know what is appropriate in those situations, considering you don't want to uh, depress somebody's respiratory effort. But if the patient is stable, uh, try first the uh, vagal maneuvers like Valsalva maneuver, uh, where you just have them bear down and increase their intra-abdominal pressure and, uh, or intra-thoracic pressure. Then there's carotid sinus massage and uh, cold stimulus. You can throw cold water on somebody, have them sit in a cold bath. If that is not effective, you can give adenosine. Um, up to three doses. I'm not sure how big the doses should be. And you follow that with a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. AFib and A-flutter. You can see on the line here that we just don't have any discernible P waves and generally the T waves would be distorted in that s s uh, situation. So um, you have the unstable cases uh, where you just immediately want to uh, do a synchronized electrical cardioversion. In stable patients, which you get a lot of elderly people with AFib especially, uh, you want to rate control using diltiazem or beta blockers. And if it's under 48 hours, then you can go ahead and uh, cardiovert if you're sure that uh, this started within the last 48 hours. If you're not sure um, or you know it's over 48 hours, then you need to anticoagulate, most importantly, because they could be throwing emboli to their brain. Uh, and then you want to uh, cardiovert after you've done a TEE, uh, a transesophageal echo, to make sure that they don't have emboli that you're going to be sending everywhere once you cardiovert. Um, make sure that this is not a Wolf Parkinson White uh, if you're going to give any nodal blockers like a beta blocker um, or calcium channel blocker. And I've got a picture here of the little delta waves that are an indication of Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Oh, just so if you're listening to this and not watching, the delta waves just look like a little ramp up to your QRS complex. Bradycardia. Uh, you treat only if it's symptomatic. The signs and symptoms may include altered mental status, hypotension, shock, chest pain, pulmonary edema. I had a patient just the other day who was a really lively guy. Uh, he was flirting with the nurses and making uh, dirty jokes. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, he uh, just his heart rate just dropped down into the 30s, and he uh, stopped talking. He didn't know what was going on when he came out of it. And uh, he threw up a couple times. And um, so this happened a few times before we ended up giving him some atropine and uh, transcutaneous pacing. So he had uh, 0.5 milligrams every three to five minutes up to six doses of atropine. And uh, the transcutaneous pacing a chronotropic agent uh, like epinephrine or uh, dopamine can be used. And then um, if your transcutaneous pacing is ineffective, then you can move on to transvenous pacing. All right, thank you to those who contributed pictures, especially James Heilman, who did a lot of EKG pictures that he's uh, posted on Wikipedia for us to use. And if anybody wants to get involved, uh, please go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer, 
or you can uh, leave comments below or share the videos with your friends to help us get the word out. Thank you very much. Have a good day.